there are many, many planets beyond our solar system. Many crazy and strange worlds out there. In this lecture, I'm going to tell you what they look like. How do we explore new worlds beyond our solar system? This is the University of the Netherlands. The universe is an amazing place. Look up at the sky and you'll see thousands of stars. And this is the same sky that we were looking at for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we were also wondering similar questions as the ones we are wondering today. Are there planets around all those stars? Planets similar to the ones that we have here in our solar system. And we live in a privileged time because for the first time in history, we have an answer to that question. We know that there are planets orbiting distant stars that we call those exoplanets. But let's take first a step back. Before the 90s, if you ask me or any other astrophysicist how many planets are out there, we would have replied, well, we only know of eight, the planets in our solar system. They are Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. All of them are orbiting the Sun, that is our central star. We don't know what happens around other stars, but in the 90s, something remarkable happened, and it's that for the first time, we discover planets orbiting around other stars, distant stars. And that really caused a revolution in astronomy. Today, only 30 years later, we know of the existence of 4,000 exoplanets, and we keep counting. Now, these discoveries have blown our minds in unimaginable ways. We found really the craziest planets. But before we go into the description of all these different crazy worlds that we are finding, I'm sure that you are wondering, if we were asking ourselves about the existence of planets around other stars for such a long time, then why did it took us so long to find them that we found them only 30 years ago? And this is because finding planets is very, very, very difficult to do. Imagine that you have a fly next to a lighthouse. Then it's going to be very difficult to see that light with all that light coming to you. Now imagine that you put that fly and the lighthouse a few kilometers away. It's going to be almost impossible to see that fly next to the lighthouse. The same thing happens with planets. Stars have a much brighter light than the ones that planets have. They are a million times brighter. And that's why they dazzle us and they don't allow us to see the planets that are next to them. But also, exoplanets are very far away. Imagine that we could travel at the speed of light. That, of course, we cannot do, but imagine that we can. Then it would take us a little bit more than one second to go to the moon. It would take us half an hour to go to Jupiter. And it would take us four years to reach the closest exoplanet. That is how far these worlds are. And that is only the closest one. We have exoplanets much farther away. But the amazing thing is that these days, we are not only able to discover these worlds, we are also able to explore them. We can see what they look like. How are the compositions of their atmospheres? And how do we know what is the atmospheric composition of a planet? I just told you how difficult it is to find them. Now imagine that we can also characterize them, just know what they look like, even planets that are very far away and that we cannot even see. Well, the way that we do that is studying the light that is coming from the stars. And we do this with a method that we call the transit method. So imagine that we have here our star and it has a planet around it. And then of course the planet is moving around the star and at some point, the planet is going to pass in front of the star. And when this happens, you will see that there is a part of this stellar light that diminishes a little bit. 
we see that first here, let's say we see the entire light of the star, and then when the planet is passing in front of it, we see that this, is, this light diminishes a little bit. And this is because of the presence of the planet that is around it. When we observe that this is happening with one star, then we know that there is a planet around it. We call this technique the transit method. And with this technique, we can also infer not only the presence of a planet, but we can also understand which is the radius of this planet, because we know which area of the stellar light is being blocked. And the cool thing of this technique is that it also allows us to study the composition of the atmospheres of exoplanets. Now, before continuing with our exoplanet story, Let's stop here a little bit to understand some things about the light. We know that the stars emit light in many different frequencies or wavelengths. Let's say that we have the sun, and then we bring the, the light of the sun, we put an instrument in the middle that could be a prism, for example, and then with this prism, we decompose the light of the sun, and then we will see a rainbow. Now, the rainbow is just a tiny part of all these frequencies. It's just a part that we can see, but there are other parts of this spectrum, as we call it, that we don't see. For example, the infrared light or the ultraviolet light. Those are also part of this spectrum of frequencies, but parts that we cannot see. Although we can detect those with different instruments. Now, Imagine, let's make this a little bit more complicated. We have our sun, we have the instrument, and in the middle, there is some gas, right? Any gas that you would like to think of. And the thing is that this gas will absorb part of this light coming from the sun. And then because it will absorb some of this light, in our spectrum, we will see that there is some light missing we will see like some dark places where the light that the gas absorbed used to be. Now, the best part is uh, each gas has absorbed a different distinctive frequency. It's like their fingerprint. So then if we see this spectrum, if we see which lines are dark, which lines are missing, we will know which was the gas that was absorbing those frequencies. So it is truly amazing that we can do this. We are detecting molecules in atmospheres of planets that are very far away, planets that we cannot even see. And we can infer their radius and the composition of their atmospheres. Now, let me give you some examples of the craziest exoplanets that we are studying at the moment. We have, as I said, radius, we have masses, we have the composition of their atmospheres, and with this, we can start trying to understand how these worlds look like. And this is one of my favorites, that are the lava worlds. These ones are rocky planets, like the Earth, or Venus, or Mars, or Mercury. But the difference is that these ones are very, very close to their stars. So close that they have temperatures on their surfaces of thousands of degrees. And because of that, they have a magma ocean on all the surface of these worlds. And this magma is going to be vaporized because they have thousands of degrees and will form an atmosphere made of vaporized rocks. That is how crazy these worlds are. And there are many of them that we are finding. Now, this was not the only surprise that we found. The other surprise has to do more with the category of planets that we have out there. If you look at our solar system, you will see that we have rocky planets like the Earth, and then we have the other ones that are the giant planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They are very different worlds, very different categories. On the rocky planets, we have a surface where we can stand on. The conditions on those surfaces are going to be very different, of course, but you can, on the end, walk on some surface. But if you go to a giant planet, there is no surface where you can walk on. We call them gas giants because they are mostly made by gas. They are mostly made by hydrogen and helium. So the composition of those planets is closer to the composition of the sun than to the composition of other rocky planets that are mostly rocks. 
and that's why they are so, so different. Now, we thought that these were the only two categories of planets, and then we started finding different exoplanets, and we found some surprises. We found that there are things in between. We found worlds that we called super-Earths. These ones are bigger than the Earth, but not as big as a giant planet. And then we have others that we call mini-Neptunes. These ones are a little bit bigger than super-Earths, but again, not as big as a giant planet. These are some categories of planets in between that we didn't know that existed because we don't have them in our solar system. And then we don't know what their atmospheres look like, what their interiors look like, how they were formed, how they reached there. They are really a big mystery to us. Now, the last category of planets uh, I want to mention, the last surprises that we found, of course, there are many others. Imagine that we have 4,000 exoplanets, so these are just some examples. Uh, the other ones are the hot Jupiters. These ones are like Jupiter, but they are very, very close to their stars. They are much closer than Mercury to the Sun. And they were a surprise. They were first the first exoplanets that we discovered belonged to this category. And if you look at our solar system, we have first the rocky planets and then the giant planets farther away. And then we start finding these worlds that are like the giant planets, but very close in. So then they really were puzzling for us. We didn't know how was it that giant planets could reach those distances. We had all our theories to explain the formation of the planets in the solar system as we see them today. So then this really put all our theories upside down. We just learned that the planets move around when they are forming. They uh, have this migration, as we call it. So then the planets that you see today, is not that they form in that place. They were moving around during this formation. So in this sense, the exoplanets also taught us some lessons about our own solar system as well. We could really learn about our own history too. And this is really some of the cool things of studying planets and all the things that we learned in these 30 years. We have masses, we have radius. We are starting to understand how these planets look like. And they are also teaching us lessons to understand things about our own history too. Now, I would like to finish this talk mentioning what is coming next. We are studying these words, we are characterizing them. And of course, the next thing that we want to know is try to find signs of life out there. That is the next thing, finding the Earth twin. And the spoiler is that we are not able to do that at the moment, but we are working very hard trying to improve our techniques, trying to get better and better instrumentations to be able to find those things out there. Finding planets out there would be amazing and would make us feel a little bit less lonely in the huge universe. Because as Carl Sagan once said, the universe is a pretty big place. If it's just us, seems like an awful waste of space. Thank you.